Now, over the weekend, the people of Ireland made their voices heard with a resolute no result in both the family and care amendments to the Constitution. Uh, the blame game is now well and truly underway with both government and opposition. And joining me in studio is Fine Gael, uh, Senator Barry Ward, uh, who is interesting in the sense that, uh, you know, senators do not apply to any constituency, but he labours in Dunleary, which was the constituency that voted Yes, a solitary constituency in the family amendment, but not in the care amendment. And also Senator Tom Clonan, who very actively canvassed uh, against these amendments. Good morning and welcome to you both. So, Barry, how do you feel uh, that Dunleary, the constituency in which I live, uh, actually got it wrong? They went against the will of the people. Well, not for the first time, Pat, as you know, Dunleary has a long history of bucking the national trend and showing its independence, and I'm glad that they did. Um, but I think what's more important is that there is a very clear message from the people here in relation to these referendums, and uh, the message has been heard loud and clear. And I was delighted to hear the Taoiseach specifically referring to some of the things Tom said during the campaign in, in saying that the government is going to have to redouble its efforts in terms of dealing with people in the care sector and those who But how do you get care. it so wrong? I mean, let, let's talk about, first of all, the target of International Women's Day, which to many of us seemed a bit cynical. You know, this is all about getting rid of the, the mother out of the Constitution, getting rid of... Well, it wasn't about that, Pat. And I well, think we no, all know, you know it what wasn't. I mean? No, it, what it was the about, was, it was always them. about modernising the Constitution and particularly in the context of women's place in the Constitution. Mm-hmm. It was a modernisation move. I think the reason International Women's Day was chosen was, first of all, it was a Friday, which suited um, because we want to enfranchise as many people as possible. And there was a certain synergy with the issues that were being put forward in this referendum. But I, I would... I would push back on the word target to International Women's Day. I think it was an appropriate synergy between the issues and the day. Um, and I think there's probably a criticism to be made in the fact that it, it was rushed to get it done in time for International Women's Day, but nothing beyond that. And nothing beyond that. Um, maybe there's a more general point that, uh, you, you know, you can talk about parents and they can be single parent families. You can be uh, two moms, two dads. You can have a mom and a dad. You can have all of those things. But the idea, maybe the country just said, hang on, you know, the mammy is special. I don't care. You know, maybe in some families there isn't a mammy. There's a granny or there's a a, a male partner. And so there's loads of different families. But at the same time, for most people, the mammy is still a bit special. And I'm not taking her out of the Constitution. Yeah, the day after Mother's Day. I like to think the mammy is special. My mammy is special. Um, But... This was not about taking the mammy out of the constitution. That wasn't. Now that was something that was put forward by people who were opposed to it. But of course, the word mother and motherhood—they're not mentioned in the constitution at all. As I say, it was about modernising the position. Um, I think uh, the teacher came out on Saturday and talked about accepting responsibility, but I personally think there's no shame in putting a question to the people and having the people reject it. The people have had their say, and that's the most important thing. And there is an inherent value in having an inter- a, a democratic statement by people across the country. Mm. In now, terms you, of the you must know, you were out canvassing and, and your fellow uh, constituency uh, person, Tom Clonan, who has t- attested to your vigour in terms of your campaigning, you must have got it on the doorsteps. I don't know what this means, Barry. Please explain, what are you talking about? Uh, this amendment and that amendment, uh, what, you know, is a durable relationship? I mean, yeah. explain. Uh, people did say that to me. I'd like to think I, I answered the questions when it was asked. Well, would you answer for but, it now? Because well, it's the uh, one thing I say that this? we haven't had answered throughout the campaign. Yeah. What is no, a durable no, no. relationship? I, I, don't, I actually don't agree that that question wasn't answered. But what I do think is important is, I don't think we can look at this result and say people didn't know what they were voting for. I think that's to disregard the intelligence of the electorate. I think what is true is people weren't happy that they knew the consequences of what they were voting for and what might come further down the line. And a lot of talk was made of the fact that the the judges and the judiciary and the courts would decide what something meant. That, of course, is true of every word and term in the Constitution. Sure, but always. there was no accompanying legislation, which there has been in previous... Uh, there has, but not always, remember. Not always, no. no but, uh, and, I mean, you could have clarified things, uh, the kind of legislation that would ensue if these were passed. This is what we would do. This is what we intend to do. And you would probably be able to indicate whether or not you had uh, support from the opposition. Yeah. But uh, you didn't allow the time anyway for that to develop. No, and, and maybe that's legitimate criticism. I think what's important is that Taoiseach has accepted the result and said that he will learn lessons from it. And I think the, the whole government will. But you mentioned the opposition there. And it's important to remember that every party in the in, in the Dáil, bar one, supported this referendum. Across the opposition, there was wide support across non-governmental organisations and, and mm. uh, groups that support particular... Now we've, we've been trying to contact uh, women who were in favour of these uh, amendments 
uh, in various organizations and you know we failed they're all gone missing um well, because it may say the National Women's Council, uh, their uh, Supremo is, I think, on leave. And that's fair enough. People are entitled to take holidays, particularly in St. Patrick's Week. But, uh, you know, th- there are questions there to, to be answered that they didn't even get the, the, the mood of the women of the country, right? No, I mean, again... So what are they? I don't think there are questions. I think there's this narrative that because the referendum was rejected, therefore somebody must be held responsible. The people had their say. The people are sovereign. They said what they had to say and now our job is to listen to them, not no, to but, question... I mean, the, if, for example, it was a 50-50, you know, 49-51, a Brexit kind of result, you'd say, well, that's fair enough, you know. But when you waste millions and millions of our money, taxpayers' money... It's not a waste money, of money, Pat. There's wh- wh- an inherent value in a democratic statement by the people of Ireland. In, in finding and this out is the you're first catastrophically one. wrong? No, well, not catastrophically wrong. Three to Sorry, one and, well, and two to one. But hang on a second. There is absolutely never a waste of money when you put a question to the people and they have their say on it. It's the first democratic statement this country has had in four years. There's no waste of money there. There's an inherent value in allowing people to have their say on what goes or doesn't go, as the case may be, into their constitution. And I don't consider that wasteful. Now, Tom, you were one of the leaders, it's fair to say, for a, a no vote. Um, you <clears throat> must feel gratified. Um, I, I feel relieved. Um, um, and I spoke to the care amendment exclusively. I, I didn't make any comment at all on, on the family amendment. I wasn't part of a no campaign. I just was trying to explain to people anyone who'd listened that as a parent and as a carer to a disabled young man that the the wording at 42B however unintentionally was toxic to the rights of, of disabled citizens. Uh, and if that had gone, if the people had accepted that and if that had gone into our constitution and I know Barry and I will probably disagree on this but I think it would have brought us into international disrepute because it flew in the face of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities specifically Article 19, which vindicates the rights of disabled citizens to live independent, autonomous lives away from their parents and family, yeah. like everybody else does. I mean, your, your point was that although in this amendment where it had been passed that the state would strive to endeavour, whatever those kind of words are, there was no guarantee uh, that uh, people who required care would, would get it from the state. Because yeah. not everyone has the kind of family infrastructure um, that can provide this, nor should maybe it be expected to at the expense of well, many other aspects of an extended y- y- family yeah, life. Yeah, but it was it was an ableist interpretation because, I mean, look, you, you don't want to live at home with your mammy, Pat. Neither do I. My, my mammy's dead, but, Certainly you know, like, mine. I, I moved out. Um, we all, um, I have three adult children and a teenager. They all want to move out and self-actualise and have independent lives. But in Ireland... Unlike other European Union jurisdictions, disabled citizens don't have a legal right to care, supports, uh, to live independently, to therapies, to surgeries, to interventions. So we're, we're out of step. And, and this wording, had it been passed, would have, would have given constitutional expression to that inequality. Now, now uh, what's there at the moment, though, doesn't help matters much. Yeah, though, but you it? can't remedy a defect by putting in a, a wording that subordinates the rights of an entire category of citizens. And you mentioned the NGOs. I am, you know, disabled citizens and carers, we were very upset and distressed by the fact that some NGOs who purport to represent the interests of disabled people and and who are generously funded actually supported a wording that was contrary to the fundamental and inalienable human rights of disabled citizens. And that's a conversation that we're going to have to have in the coming weeks. But I suppose my, my you asked me how I felt, but look, I know Barry. Uh, Barry's a, a family friend of ours and, and a neighbour, and I've seen him over the last 25 years, how hard he works in our constituency. And I know that he, there are good people in all of the political parties. What I want now is for us to be able to work together. And I have legislation that I'm going to introduce in the coming weeks that will give carers and, and disabled citizens the legal right to a social model of, of care supports. And I also want to progress my disability rights bill from last year. And I did enjoy support from, from government in that last summer and I, I want to bring it to the next stage and bring it forward. Is it more likely that you will get government support given the embarrassment of what has happened? Well, I don't think it's embarrassment. That they could reclaim some high ground. Well, I, I think the narrative, I think this could be an inflection point for, for positive change. They... Over a million people, three to one, voted, I think, to vindicate the rights of 
our, our right to, to care. I don't I don't think it was a rejection of, uh, you know, or, you know, trying to teach the government a lesson or try to punish them or give them a wallop. I don't, I don't accept that. I think people listened to the arguments and decided, you know what, this isn't right. This isn't the right wording. We want to give disabled citizens the supports that they have, that they enjoy in other European and Union jurisdictions. So I think the government... And colleagues will realise now that there are actually votes in disability rights, that there are political consequences. But the other interpretation, Tom, is that uh, people said to themselves, I don't understand this. When in doubt, leave it out. Well, So it may not have been that they knew what they would be allowing to happen if they voted yes, but they simply didn't know well, one the, way the, or the other. The volume of correspondence that I got from disabled persons organisations, these are actual... Uh, disabled persons groups, not the service providers or the state funded NGOs, the DPOs themselves, the amount, the volume of correspondence I got from them and from from carers and people in the community. And everywhere I go, people say, you know, we listen to what you said. We listen to what disabled activists said. And that's why we rejected it. But, you know, without getting down into the weeds of why that is or why it might not be. But I think there is this is an inflection point where something positive could flow from this. And and. You know, there are anachronistic wordings in the Constitution that do need to be remedied. And I'm hoping that if not this administration, then the next administration will, will deal with that. And, and you know, there's a couple of lessons to be learned here. The Constitution, the Citizens' Assembly and the Joint Oireachtas Committee on Gender Equality gave really good advice to the government. And they, they chose, for whatever reason, not, not to, to, to follow that and actually edited out references to care supports in the community. M- maybe the next time... Because I think Citizens Assembly, that kind of deliberative process is really useful that they, they, they might actually, okay. you know, pay I'll, pay I'll read you some it. of the comments from listeners in a moment. But one of them, and uh, I think it's replicated a few times, is about the advice from the AG, which was not shared with the people. Now, it has been, I think, originally denied that the government got this advice, but it's now clear they did get this advice about what might happen post-referendum. Uh, uh, if it were passed, that all of this would end up in the courts and there was no way to predict what the courts would decide. And yet that was not shared. Well, Attorney General's advice is, is never shared. That's not the way it works. It's it's very, very unusual. And, and the the whole point is that it is legal advice to the government in the same way, Pat, that if you got legal advice from your solicitor, you wouldn't want it to be shared with anyone okay, else. Can, so, can we just parse that a little bit mm-hmm. a second? Because if, for example, the legal advice was vote yes, 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 it's all grand, you would be accused of propagandising with the AG's advice. Mm-hmm. So therefore, whether it was... Good, ba- uh, good uh, towards the S yes, or bad towards the S, yes, you were never going to share it. Is that your point? Yeah, that that would be normally be the way. And I'm not saying that it has never, it has never, never, never been shared. But it is the practice that the Attorney General's advice on any subject, be it a referendum or a piece of legislation or a given issue, is not shared or made public. It's private advice that's afforded to the government. But I hope. Uh, and again, I come back to the fact that the teacher has accepted this result. And I hope that what comes from this maybe is, in light of what Tom was discussing there, and, and specifically as reference to ableist language in this, if we can now step back and say, we, because I've worked a lot with, with groups who represent various um, issues in terms of the disability sector, if we can come back, step back and look through all of these issues in future through the prism of people with disabilities, be it physical or intellectual, to make sure that it's proofed against ableist language, to make sure that there is inclusion for everyone, that will be a real victory from this referendum. Mm-hmm. Tom? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, the, the leak... The leaking of the AG's advice just on the point of the kicking in of the moratorium the day before the polls was was very very interesting timing. It certainly raised my eyebrows. Um, So who leaked it? Well, that's a a matter for the people who have privileged access to that information. I I doubt it was in a very wide uh, circle of of hands. I mean, I I suspect that it was leaked deliberately to... uh, I suppose, give some momentum to the care referendum because there was a suggestion by some of the talking heads that the, the that the AG's advice suggested that there was some judici- justiciable element to to the wording. But I mean, really, I, I, I find that analysis quite narrow. There should have been a, a, an explicit vindication of the socioeconomic rights of disabled citizens. But what's interesting in this path, though, I think is the, is the role that the Shannon has played in all in this major national debate, I think it has vindicated, you know, the the the, the requirement for an upper house to hold uh, government to account. Now, I think the Shannon needs reform, um, and and that's that's coming. I think uh, I think my, the next election will probably be the last uh, election of its kind for the university panels. Mm-hmm. Um, so we will see change, but I think it has 
copper fastened the the value and the role of of the Shannon and, and independent voices in the Senate. Um, there's another point I want to put to you, Barry, and I heard Padler Tobin of uh, Aintu making this point. Uh, that the cabinet is basically an urban cabinet. And his suggestion, and I'm only uh, inferring from what he said, that what he meant was it's kind of a woke cabinet, that the voices of ordinary politicians, ordinary TDs, are not actually heard around the cabinet table. I don't think that's true at all. And I think well, na- name you know, some of the people who would Heather be... Heather Humphreys was our Director of Elections. She's okay. from um, rural Monaghan. She's definitely not an urban uh, minister. Um, you know, that I, there's any number of ministers, but... I don't think for a second that you could say that if because somebody is from X place that they can't represent somebody from Y place. Just as as a man, I can't represent women or as a straight person, I can't represent gay people. Like it, this is a fallacy that is sometimes perpetuated by people and it suits their agenda. No, I'm but ha- for example, we've often talked about the lack of business acumen around the cabinet table. That w- when something is being proposed that might cause millions or billions of our money, that there's no one there to say, hang on a second... Uh, have you looked at the cost benefit of this year? Depending on the civil service, none of whom, by and large, have ever been in business either. No, I, I so, disagree. I think you know, I, I'm giving that as an example of how cabinets but I think might to say be that, touch. To say that, Pat, is to misunderstand the skill of a politician. Every one of the people who sits around the cabinet table has been elected by their communities and has functioned as a politician for a number of years. There is a skill in that, in coming to ideas that are saleable, that are workable and that serve this country. And remember, the governments of the last number of years, going back to the financial crash, have served this company, this country incredibly well in terms of bringing us through the financial crisis, the pandemic, the, the war in Ukraine, the cost of living crisis. So, I mean, it's, of course it's legitimate to criticise the government, but I don't think there's a basis to say that they, that they haven't got the acumen to do the job. I'll, I'll read you some of the text now. Is it too much to ask the writers of the referendum wordings to actually list the durable relationships that they have in mind. There must be a limit to the permutations, so let's see them. Too late, but the minimum needed for a second go. And so the people have spoken, but the side still say it was right and the people are regrettably wrong. Uh, sorry, lads, you spent over 20 million on this farce. Is that guy having a laugh? The consequences of us voting no. Ask why our AG advice was not given to the people. That's great about the two votes. I do feel sorry for long-term partners who have kids, but the wording is a disgrace. It will be put again, but I suspect that the government only had the votes to distract from the terrible state of the country. That's from Pat in Dublin. 23 million spent on the referendum and no one needs to be held accountable. That's more arrogance. Uh, another one saying the same. Utter arrogance saying it wasn't a waste of money. Still doubling down. Still not listening. Uh, why does the government have to be sorry for the referendum result? It shouldn't matter to them. They asked the question. The result was no. Grand move on, says Terry in Dunleary. I didn't know what I was voting for. My friends didn't know what they were voting for. I got no information from the government. Well, you did get the leaflet, or you should have, and it was widely available. Uh, This man on your show saying people knew what they were voting for. Well, I didn't. Inform Barry that myself and my family and all my friends were extremely confused about the non-information that the public received about how best to vote. Now, we did have the, the chair of uh, An Commission Thauchan in on two occasions to outline all of that and to answer questions. But at the end of the day, um, she had to work with the wordings that were handed to her. I'm one of the 350,000 full-time mums who voted no on the referendum because I wanted to retain the clause that validates my role in the home. Mothers usually feel ignored and unseen by the Irish state, but on Friday our fellow citizens stood up for us. Carers also deserve their own clause but that should never have been offered by the government in return for removing the clause for mothers at home. Many thanks to the Irish people. Last comments, General Tom. Yeah, look, I, I think disagreement is a good thing. I, I don't think it's a it's part of a, a democratic space. And, you know, the fact that we disagree with the, each other does not mean that we cannot be friends. And I've, I've noticed that quite a lot of people who I disagree with uh, you know, we're able to continue and have a dialogue and a conversation. We haven't quite yet reached the point that they have in Washington or London where there's so much polarity and cancel yeah. culture that people can't work together. I hope that from this we can move forward and work together for right. the rights of disabled citizens. Yeah, I, I think Tom's right. The people have had their say. That's the most important thing. They have been heard. They will be listened to. And I think there's an opportunity now for the government to take on board, was said, particularly in relation to care and, and some of Tom's private members' legislation, to progress that and hopefully create a better environment for those who need it. All right. Uh, Fine Gael Senator Barry Ward and Independent Senator Tom Clonan, thank you both very much for joining us.